Thanks so much for the invitation. Um, I want to, uh, to ask you to think about infrastructure and think about it in a slightly new way. Not the way that we're used to thinking about infrastructure, which is you know, how do we build it, what tools do we use, how do we maintain it, how do we scale it. Well, a little bit about how we scale it, actually. But I want to, uh, to ask what, what does it mean to have smart infrastructure? Today we, we're starting to talk about uh, smartphones, obviously, uh, smart buildings, smart cities, smart cars, all of these smart things. And it's often related to discussions about the Internet of Things, the arrival of all of these new devices. <coughs> That's sometimes a story that we keep separate from the infrastructure which we think of as cloud. And when we think of smart infrastructure, today we're thinking about the cloud. How do we instantiate software-defined infrastructure, software-defined networking, software-defined servers, um, software-defined clusters, so software-defined services, how do we define all of these things? And I'm not sure why we've chosen to separate these things into two, uh, two parts. Probably it's, a, it's an industrial thing because of marketing uh, silos and so on. But, but in fact, these things are coming rapidly together. And in a few years' time, I believe that the, what we call the cloud today and what we call the Internet of Things will simply be one homogeneous thing. So I, I think we need to, to start to think about how we, how we talk about infrastructure, how we talk about smart environments, what do we want from these smart environments, and how are we going to be able to um, create them. And one observation that I often have is that we think very much in central, centralized terms. When we think of systems, we think of centralization as a way of, as a means of control. And when faced with large scale, centralization has obvious difficulties like bottlenecks. And yet, in some of the largest networks on, on the Earth, this, this is a beautiful picture from uh, Taiwan Metro Station. Um, in some of these very large networks, which are transportation, um, IT, telephony, and so on, we have these meeting points, these points of centrality where we, people come together and things come together. And it's worth analyzing why we make systems like this and what it means for us as we, we turn to scale systems. Because as we get bigger and bigger, these central points that we often identify with become harder and harder for everybody to, to visit. So, um, I want to talk a little bit about centralization, what it means to be smart, and the talk is called Brains, Society, and Semantic Spaces, and hopefully this will start to make some kind of sense as we, as we continue. So, this is a nice quote. Some of you may know this from a, a song. Machine Messiah, the search for a, a higher controller. Show me the strength of your singular, centralized eye. Shows just how much we think of in terms of brains and sing, singular points when we're trying to think of control. If we look back at technology, of course, the history of technology is almost about the history of centralization. We had mainframes, and I picked this picture because it looks a little bit like the, the Taiwan uh, meeting point. The Cray, of course, was uh, very symbolic in IT in creating great power in a single place, in a single location, very focused, very localized. And as we build systems and scale them up, we had things like mainframes, Mainframes you could expand uh, on the fly. And then we distributed everything uh, in the 1980s to try to bring the computing to a wider audience, to spread it around and bring it, to, bring it into society, away from this uh, sort of machine messiah, <coughs> to, to the edge of society where society needs it. And so there's a story about 
centralization versus decentralization, which is about whether it's about for a few privileged users or whether it's for all of us. And as we scale up, we've started recreating this kind of machinery at a larger scale. So today we have cloud, and it's in some sense decentralized, but in another sense it's also centralized in a data center. So it's not at the edge with us, where perhaps the Internet of Things might be, but it's out there, far away in Amazon's basement, or in Microsoft's basement, or in Google's basement. And we go halfway around the planet to find this machine messiah to do all of our, our work for us. And it's worth asking the question, is that a good way to scale systems when it has to apply to everybody, all of us at the edge? So we see physical centralization. Um, and then we can ask, what does it mean to, that uh, the system is smart? <coughs> and for many of us, I think smart means Software. We put software in it. If we put software in it, it will be smart. How many people think putting software in something will make it smart? Ah. <laughs> A wise, I think, I'm not sure if it's early morning apathy or, um, or, or what, but I tend to agree with you. <laughs> be very cautious about putting software in stuff and expecting it to be smart. Uh, but let's ask that question as well. But there is one obvious case in which centralization makes sense to us, and that is ourselves, our brains. You know, our intelligence, or if we want to call it that, is uh, is associated with our brains, and our brains are very centralized. Uh, all of the processing is done in basically our heads, and all of the networks go throughout our bodies to the actuators at the edge, and there are these feedback loops connecting them together. And the reason that works uh, is because the brain is fast enough to manage that process. It doesn't, if the brain wasn't was so slow that the latency from you know, the fingertips to the brain uh, and all of the senses coming together and the brain had to process all of that, if it was so slow that it couldn't stop us walking into walls or walking off the edge of a cliff or uh, you know, whatever, it wouldn't be very good, and it wouldn't be an evolutionary stable strategy, so we wouldn't be alive. So centralization is associated with having a lot of computing power or a lot of processing power to make it very fast in a small space of time. But when we do that, interesting things happen. When we bring together a whole system into one point, into a localized space, we have the ability to mix together all of those signals. If we take away our heads and just just act like starfish, where each sensor is basically an independent thing, or like a worm, where you cut it in half and it, it continues as two worms, uh, we are sort of fragile, but we also have a lot more intelligence because we bring together all of those signals and we can compare them, orchestrate them, um, coordinate them, and so on, and also put together different ideas. An idea that the eyes has and have and the ears have connected with the fingers can we, we can turn into a new innovation. So bringing things together into small space also allows innovation, as we'll see uh, in larger systems in a minute. So centralization clearly has some good aspects. It has to do with uh, being able to mix up information and innovate. It needs speed to make it successful. If it's too slow, it doesn't work anymore. So it requires a lot of computing power in a small space. Um, but the downside is it becomes somewhat fragile. If I cut my head off, it doesn't work anymore. <coughs> so does smart really imply centralized? Well, I don't think it does. But there is something to be said for the centralization anyway. What I think centralization uh, allows us to talk about is a human experience. And probably what we should recognize is that we think so much in terms of our own model of having a brain and, and hands and fingers that the way we think about almost everything is influenced by that. If you look at uh, 
Some of you may know that my background is in automation, and I, I'm going to argue that automation is the opposite of smart, because it's trying to take away a central brain. Um, you've probably seen how approaches to try to take away that central point of control have very quickly been pushed aside by new and more powerful approaches to re-centralize control again and make it part of us. And I'm thinking of the shift from things like CF Engine and Puppet and Chef back towards things like Ansible and Salt, which are much more command line driven, back to things like Kubernetes, where we're typing on a command line and pushing out uh, instructions or destructions to a large, you know, a large area. This is exactly how we work as humans. We have a brain, we have an idea, we push it out to our hands, our fingers, and we basically want the world and the tools that we use to be an extension of our bodies. So we love this ability to just type on the command line and push it out to hundreds and thousands of places and machines, no matter how risky or dangerous that might actually be. Uh, on the other hand, we have a different model, which I call the society model, which is much more decentralized, where in a society, of course, we set up organizations, call them silos, if you want, uh, institutions that handle specialized tasks. And we delegate the specialization of certain things to particular different controllers that manage different aspects. And then they work together more slowly. And this is, this is more like the starfish. This is more like the uh, distributed, decentralized model. So this is harder to destroy. This is quite easy to destroy. This, we know it scales to large size because society gets pretty big. And yet, we're still very much attached to this centralized way of thinking because we see it as smart. <coughs> what I think is the point here is that when we think of centralization, we associate centralization with our human selves, because this is how we are, and we tend to make centralized things, they, they represent the human aspect of system, a, a place to go, a meeting point. You look into the eyes of the system at a particular point. You visit your bank in a particular location at the branch where it exists. You have a particular point of entry to a website. You know exactly where to go, where to identify uh, a site by its single point of entry. And this centralization allows us to think identity. So centralization is very much to do with identity and recognition for, for humans. Points of service, identities, a home, a sense of having a home. It's local and it's somewhat simple, question mark. But it's simple in the sense that it's easy to understand because it's all in one place. And we associate these things with our intent, what we want. When we go, when we know what we want, or we try to get what we want, we go to a particular place. And then the decentralized thing is the opposite. When we dehumanize the system because we want to take people out of the system, maybe to scale it up, then we tend to decentralize it. So logistics, transportation. Um, replication, mass production, storage, archiving, um, it becomes non-local, delocalized. It becomes somewhat more complicated, harder to understand, a bit like uh, a colony of ants instead of a single organism. And the behaviors that we get out of it are less, seem less predictable, more sort of emergent that what comes out of the system seems uh, harder to understand, a bit more, a bit like magic. So there, there are reasons why we don't like decentralized systems and why we do like centralized systems. But the decentralized systems are coming. Here they are. This is taken from uh, American, uh, what's it called? Uh, yeah, home improvement uh, depot or something like this. Now, big business selling all these crazy little devices to put in your house, uh, light bulbs with IP addresses, just what we needed. 
so it's kind of maths at the moment, but in a few years' time, we will start to understand what, what it, we're really supposed to be doing with these devices, which data we're interested in collecting and what we're interested in doing with them. Um, but right now, it's sort of a business initiative. You know, let's put software into everything. But that's probably a good thing, because then we'll be really flexible and we can get the data, and that'll be good. And we're a little bit concerned about surveillance by the NSA or the CIA, the FBI, Europol, Facebook, <laughs> uh, you know, whoever today. But just you wait until we have these devices everywhere. Then we will really be pushing at the edge. <coughs> and yet this is sort of the natural extension of where we were in the 80s, trying to put computers in everybody's houses. Now we're, we've got them in our pockets, uh, in the walls, and really, really wiring ourselves up. <coughs> then as we extend into the environment, we start talking about things like smart cities. This uh, beautiful picture of Shenzhen, which I took, it's a huge, smart, modern city. And the idea that by embedding software services or information services into a city, we could make the city itself somehow smart. Now, what would that mean? Well, let's think about that. How then would this not just affect the infrastructure, but how does this affect human lives? It's not just about can we deploy our application to, the, to a large number of people to the customer base anymore, but it's about how does this influence our daily lives? A city is the story of our, uh, our lives, our daily lives. Everything that we do happens in the space of towns and cities and communities. So when we're redesigning those things, we want to think a bit carefully about what it means for us, not just for the technology. So the question is, what, what would make a system smart, and in particular an IT system, so we can apply this back to uh, you know, our day-to-day -day infrastructure problems. And then the question is, will that scale? So will it scale from a single human to a society to a city? How does it scale? So let's think about smart. I've given you some hints already, but what I want to argue is that smart really means two things, essentially two things. Uh, it means that what we come up with, what a system does, is fit for some purpose that we imagine. You know, if somebody does something crazy, you don't think they're smart. If somebody does something that helps you in a particular context, you think, oh, that was good. You, you were smart. She was smart. And it also happens to, has to happen fast enough. If, some, you know, if you're trying to solve a problem, you can't open the tin of beans. Somebody comes up with a great way to do it. You think, that was smart. But if they come back next week and tell you, I know how to do it, then you think, yeah. So it's two things. It's both speed and the ability to put relevant ideas and information into context. This is quite a, um, an interesting and tricky thing. It's not about algorithms, because algorithms cache thinking that we've done in the past and try to repeat it multiple times. Algorithms are not usually adapting to context. They're just stupidly repeating things over and over. So we associate algorithmic behavior with dumb behavior. Cells are kind of dumb. They have a simple <coughs> algorithm coded in DNA. Factories are kind of dumb, they, even though they put together cars, because they just keep doing the same thing again and again. They don't know when to start and stop. They have no reasoning beyond what has been pre-programmed into them. So pre-programmed is not really what we mean by smart. But there are two things. I mean, if, you, if you've seen any of my talks before, you know I talk about two aspects of any system are its dynamics, its speed, its size, all of the measurable things, and its semantics what it means, what it's for, what's its purpose. Those two aspects together. And then today we're talking a lot about application-centric infrastructure, what, does, what do applications do for us. So maybe that has something to do with it as well. Well, OK, speed. This is a, a graph that I made. It's on my website, um, if you can't see it very well. This is time scales going up here. So we've got months, days, hours, minutes, seconds, uh, hundreds of a second, 
10 to the minus 4 seconds, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 10. And then what processes in our systems happen at those time scales? And here we have months where you have things like adding network, server management, manual processes. And then hours and minutes, you have DNS and updates. Um, you have the ability to add a server, you know, it takes typically minutes to hours. And then as we get faster and faster, we get to uh, how long does it take to make a physical box, a virtual box, install a package, start a container. And this is getting faster and faster, which is challenging us to think uh, differently. Time to look up a DNS name, start a TCP session, and then seek. Uh, in the disk, seek in the SSD, all the way up to a CPU clock cycle, and we're getting very, very fast. And, and as our infrastructure gets faster and becomes more efficient, we have to control, in order to control it with our singular I, we have to get faster as well, otherwise we don't, we're not smart. Right? So smart is, is relevant context in, at the right speed means we have to get faster and faster and faster. And then our technologies are sort of changing as well. So we started out and it was fine to use manual control because things were pretty slow. And then things got faster and we got, uh, we needed other tools to help us. And then we got faster still. And then these tools start to look dumb because because they're not fast enough. And then we're getting a new, a new range of tools which are addressing the new time scale, spinning up and down containers, which is a much faster uh, operation, and so on and so on. And this will eventually go all the way back up to uh, the top here when we have operating systems again. Because this stuff up here is basically what we call multitasking operating systems. And our data centers, our clouds, and our spaces will be controlled by some kind of dedicated operating system and not these separate tools that involve people all the time. Um, so if we plot this uh, on a slightly different graph where these are times, so this is the time at which some problem, perturbation, change, error, fault happens, and this is the speed at which we can respond, sorry, the time at which we can respond, so getting longer up here. The longer it takes us, the dumber it seems. And the faster we're able to respond relative to a, a change, the smarter we seem to be. And then we're in this race coming down here towards the origin as things are getting faster and faster. <coughs> so our technology and our processes are in a it's kind of an arms race to get down here, and we're trying to we're trying to stay smart or dumb depending on what strategy seems to be best. Now, um, if a change happens and you can react quickly, this is good. The system can be stable. If it's stable, it's, re re it's dependable, we can rely on it, it's functional. If it's unstable, if it doesn't do what we expect, and it's changing all the time, we can't use it. So, for example, if you're flying your plane, the autopilot says, um, we're about to fly into a mountain, the plane says, sorry, processing, busy, uh, come back in half an hour, this isn't helpful. This is an unstable system. If it's able to instantly respond and fly around the mountain, this is good. So, as we put these technologies onto this kind of, uh, this graph, we see that they're all kind of straddling in between what we mean by smart and dumb. Now, we wouldn't call any of these technologies particularly smart. They're not reasoning, they're not thinking, they're not adapting. They're basically just trying to be stable, keep machines running in a fixed purpose <coughs> at most of the time. And it's an arms race. You know, we're getting, trying to get faster and faster and faster going this way, but we're not really changing our approach to be smart or dumb or something like this. Um, now think about what happens with scale as we increase the size of the system. 
if your system is really small, it's cheap and easy to make it fast and efficient. But as it grows bigger and bigger and bigger, it gets slower. You know, uh, animals basically get to the size of a blue whale, it's the biggest mammal on the planet, and then they stop. Because it's getting so slow that it can't basically uh, survive. Uh, if it got any slower, it would be just easy prey. So as we increase the size, the system seems to get dumber because it's getting relatively slower. <coughs> two, two reasons. One is that the latency from the point of action to the point of control is getting longer. So the network is slow. And also the, the amount of things as the system grows, it grows like n squared in the number of things. The area around the system being served by the central controller is growing in size, like the square of the distance. So it's getting much slower, much faster. So this strategy of centralization is going to be a problem. In order to, for centralization to work, the brain part, the central controller, whether it's a brain, a CPU, a cloud, a data center, that has to grow much, much faster uh, as the size grows faster. So does smart imply centralized? I think we, we understand that this is not the case. We, we associate smart with brains, that's just because of our origins. But we also know that if we look at the scale, if we look at a brain through a microscope, it's actually a very decentralized thing. This looks like a singular eye in, in a system at a large scale, but when we look at a small scale, it looks like a very homogeneous blob of similar cells acting together as a society. So society, brain, brain society, aren't they two different things? No, they're not two different things. They're actually just two different scales. And this is what we need to understand. If we want to understand how systems scale, and how smart they can be, scaling is the important thing. So if we need a fast response, we could localize feedback and become smart again at a smaller scale by pre-programming responses into small cells. This is how we embed algorithms. This is how we... Um, uh, this is basically a, a flinch response, a, a, what do you call it, a reflex response. But if we want to perform the kind of reasoning, the kind of innovation that brains are good at, then we have to accept the fact that that gets slower. And it gets slower because the control loops, the feedback loops, are getting longer and longer and bigger and bigger. They're taking longer, and it requires more and more work, faster and faster processes in order to scale those things. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so here's a question for you. Is an AWS data center a centralized system or a decentralized system? What do you think? Who would say intuitively that it's a centralized thing? Both of them. Both of them. Both of them. Well, okay, yeah. I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> Both of them. Yeah, exactly. Let me just sort of put this into some perspective. Uh, in a slightly different context, which is agriculture, farming, which, by the way, is one of the key uh, application areas for an Internet of Things. When we start a process, uh, and we don't really know what we're doing, we, we try to, we use our brains, here's the brain, uh, and we try to in uh, innovate, uh, we try to improvise, improvise. And so, we want to pick berries, we want to make wine. So we go, we find berries in the forest, we pick them where we can find them, it's all very opportunistic. And we figure, okay, what can we do with these things? And we're innovating, bringing it all together and figuring it out. And then we realize, oh, this is too much work for one person, we need to scale it up. So then we create power tools to help us to do it in the same way that we would do it with our hands. We basically make bigger hands. Um, and we're still trying to do it opportunistically. And in the end, we find that, you know what, this doesn't make any sense at all. If we wanted to really scale this up, we would take the human out of the loop. we take all the thinking out of the loop and just take what we've learned and cache it in a design, a mechanical, physical 
decentralized design where we've taken out the very essence of thinking. What exactly what we mean by smart, we take it out and we program it, hardwire it into the space in which this process is going to happen. In other words, we don't just create a machine inside the space, we take the whole of space itself and we adapt it to that function. This is what I mean by smart space. Because, I mean, how smart is this plant, really? <laughs> but the process that the entire thing uh, carries out seems kind of like a smart answer to the problem of scaling up this particular production um, scheme. And this is how we scale everything in business. We start out by experimenting, we customize, brains are good, smart is good. We productize, and we, now we're starting to understand or fix in stone exactly what we're trying to do. And then we commoditize and make it into a utility. And then we're basically going to take all of the thinking out of it and just re replicate, replicate, replicate. This is, this is kind of like sex. In the beginning, we're having lots of sex, figuring out new stuff, mixing genes, mixing ideas. And eventually, we're just replicating the thing that we came up with. This is how we scale the system. And of course, this looks... The <coughs> The right-hand side of this looks suspiciously like this, which is pretty much how we design data centers today. And the point is that we have adapted space itself to the process of producing exactly what, uh, what it was that we were trying to do. A final example is, uh, this is my favorite slide. I, I use this in every slide, every talk that I possibly can. This is how we uh, take humans out of a system this is how we take thinking out of a system, how we take what we believe to be smart out of a system and replace it by adapting space itself to fix a problem. So you have a flood, it's unexpected, it's a challenge, it's a fault, we need to fix it. Men come with tools. First they try and do it with their hands, it doesn't work, we need a tool, so they make this tool, this centralized tool, vacuum cleaner they install, you know, puppet, CF engine, whatever here, and start sucking into water, but it's it's still command line. It's still here they are issuing commands. Busy. But it's not scaling very well. And then somebody comes along and they realize, hey, you know what? Oops. Let's do this right hand side thing. Let's actually program space itself in the design, the architecture of the system, to take water away. Because that's quite a good idea. And so this smart solution, which is really dumb, and it does nothing but suck water down a hole, uh, this appears very smart at the larger scale. So this is how we adapt systems and adapt space-time to make it smarter and functional for our needs in a particular context. Being distributed, it's very fast. It doesn't have to be centralized. These guys don't even have to know that it's happening. We don't have to page them in the middle of the night. This all happens taking humans out of the loop. Now, taking humans out of the loop is slightly misleading. We're really just partitioning humans and uh, space into two different categories. The humans are still there, because if they weren't there, we wouldn't care if it flooded. So the humans are the users, and they're still using this space, even though they're not any longer involved in maintaining the space. So we've simply separated concerns slightly. We haven't really taken humans out of the loop. If this drain was so big that humans could fall down it, we wouldn't like it anymore. So we still have to think about humans in the design of something which is very impersonal and doesn't seem to have anything to do with humans being in the system. Humans are still in the system, let's be careful. Okay, you get the idea. I thought this was a good idea, and so I started a project uh, a couple of years ago to talk about space times with semantics, where I figure out how to use promise theory, which is one of my things, to design spaces 
you know, the most general idea of any kind of system what that fills real space, how do we turn that into something functional? And how do we assure its functionality as it grows and scales and gets bigger without failing? And this is where a nice background in physics uh, comes along. We can do all of these nice mathematical models. We can start to try to turn some of these things into technologies. Um, and this is nice. This is, uh, this is something that makes, first of all, theoretical sense. It's something we should definitely spend time thinking about if we're going to design architectures, software, hardware, um, cloud, IoT, and so on. And actually, we're starting to see <coughs> pardon me, some aspects of this. This is, um, any of you guys do networking? This is a, a CLOS architecture, which is a common thing starting to appear in the largest kind of data centers. It's, uh, it's called folded CLOS architecture, where you have servers down here and, and spine switches here, and you have various tiers. And each switch, or each pathway, has redu multiple redundancy. So if there's a failure, it simply goes a different way, and it's, it's not disconnected. This kind of fabric. Uh, is basically a space, a smart space, and it's smart because it's been wired in a particular way. The, the way we connected the space together is the smart part about it. Otherwise, it's just the same as any other network. But what's smart about it is the, the redundancy, the, the structure of it, and how that scales quite nicely. Because the distance between any two nodes is pretty much the same anywhere in this network if you go east to west. And from north to south, it's super reliable because you have multiple redundancy. <coughs> Problem with this, of course, is that this is actually what it looks like in the data center. Um, and because we don't understand space very well in computer science or in IT engineering, this is what we do. Uh, when we draw this system, we draw it in two dimensions and we draw it as a tier model, like a hierarchy because that's what they teach us in computing. And when you try and make that in nice square racks, this is what it looks like. <coughs> but actually, if you separate it out and you think about it in terms of space, if you make it into a circular radial geometry, you don't have to have any folding, you don't have to have any wires crossing, you can actually have straight line, line of sight connections between the incoming points and the servers arranged around here, you could do it with lasers. You don't even need cables. You probably know that the biggest cost of making a data center is the cabling, of maintaining the cabling. So if you could eliminate cabling, you could save billions of dollars. Billions of dollars. All you need to do is think about how to use space more efficiently. How do we program it into space instead of taking, instead of thinking in the human-centric view? How do we dehumanize it and take out the human thinking in order to make that space efficient? <coughs> we do this all over the place. So here's a. This is also, this is Hong Kong actually. <coughs> oh, pardon me. We tend to think of uh, data as with a warehouse analogy, stacking stuff on shelves, storage devices, servers in racks, and so on. Um, but smart warehouses today are actually adapting by moving things around so that they're more easily accessible. You've probably heard about uh, department stores that move the most popular goods to the, the entrance so people can find them very quickly. Or if they're really sneaky, they move it right to the back, so you have to go all the way through the store and pick up all the other things. In order to find the stuff. But the fact that you can adapt the, the locations, relative locations of things, uh, to make them more localized, not necessarily centralized, but localized, to make it faster, allows you to adapt space to solve a particular problem, which is fetching data, fetching goods, fetching information. Then we have cloud computing, which is basically a tenancy model. Um, you're renting out apartments, basically, in, in the cloud. Here's a server. 
here's a container, fill it with what you like, um, provide whatever services you like from the windows. But this is tenancy, and this adapts by definition by delegating to the tenant. So all of the smartness is, is in the tenant who is using the space, and the space is very non-discriminatory. It doesn't really care what you do with it. And as a result, it provides just basic utilities, power, lighting, water, drain, and so on. And just like the cloud, you've got your network, you've got your CPU, you've got your storage, pretty basic stuff. But um, it doesn't give you much help if you have special needs. <coughs> it scales very nicely and it's very cheap to build because it's kind of like the hydroponics farm or the server racks. But if you have very special needs, if you're still improvising or if you need to use the space around you in a particular way, it's not so good anymore. So here's an example where that kind of design simply doesn't work. This is a very careful, this is the California, um, the San Francisco uh, uh, Philharmonic House. This is a space which has purposely been designed with one function in mind, which is to make music. It's centralized in the sense that it's functionally central. It does just one thing. It's not generic, it can't be reused. You probably wouldn't want to rent out these chairs for arbitrary businesses to set up shop. But there's going to be a performance, and notice that the people in here are very much part of the system. The whole space is filled with people, things, music, instruments, and they're all very close together and very closely connected. So there's the orchestra, yes, they're producing a, a little bit of stuff, and then there are people listening, and, but the, the sound is bouncing off the walls, the walls are making the sound, and the whole experience is tied to this one space. <coughs> We do have cases like this, where we cannot just call dial up Amazon and say, give me a, a virtual machine and we'll make it good. Sometimes you really have to adapt space and time very specifically for the, for the, uh, the task that you're <coughs> providing. So to just sort of emphasize that point, this is also, this is uh, China again. Just look at how we occupy space, the functional spaces we create. A bookshop, uh, isn't this lovely? You have people reading books in the bookshop. They're interacting with the space, and it allows them to do that. They are part of the system. Even though we've separated the knowledge from the humans by putting it into books or into storage, the interactions <coughs> are facilitated by the space. This wonderful messy street is filled with services, advertisements, billboards, uh, infrastructure, and people interacting with it in a kind of a messy way. And this is really the extension of what we started in the 1980s when we were trying to figure out how to do user interface design on computers, taking the system right to the edge, right to where the humans are, not centralized in some uh, remote location, but um, quite far away. <clears throat> so what evidence do we have that these kinds of things are important? Last year I bumped into some people from the Santa Fe Institute in America who study cities. Cities, of course, are operating systems, information systems where people live, they're spaces that are occupied by people. Um, originally, of course, they were designed around defense. People come together, localized because they can defend themselves. But once they centralize like this, the smart things take over, the brain functions take over, the mixing, the ideas, the innovation, the speed of innovation. If you compare the Western civilization to Eastern civilization, West wars all the time, clustering into cities, lots of innovation associated with warfare. Eastern civilization, agrarian, agriculture, everyone with their own land, very peaceful, not much going on, very little innovation. So the West overtook the East in technology because of warfare, because of cities, because of centralization. It's interesting. <clears throat> now, people who study these cities figure out that the reason cities work is because infrastructure is small and cheap, 
but you can put together and network people, connect them together in ways <coughs> that allow that innovation to take place. So at the scale of a city, a city is sort of like a brain. Um, but of course, we can also think of it as a very decentralized system because it's all over the place and mixed up with us all together. So when we start to think about the Internet of Things and putting it into something like this, how could, we, how could technology now help us to be more smart, have, more like a brain? How do we find things? How do ideas find each other? How do they mix together? And then how do they get produced and cached into processes so that they can fill a space, adapt to space, and turn it into something useful? There is one interesting lesson here which comes from uh, South America. One of the things they teach us in IT is separation of concerns. Break things into nice classes, you know, keep them all separate and tidy. This is what they tried to do when they designed new cities in South America. This is Brasilia. And what they did when they separated the city into microservices by having your shopping here, your offices here, your housing here, they created a, a, a network <coughs> problem. Everybody is stuck in traffic trying to drive from one thing to another. And the city ground to a halt. It has terrible traffic problems because you're sending so much nonsense over the network that you don't really need to send. <clears throat> if instead you take the Chinatown model and you just stuff it all together in a local space, it's not tidy, but it is efficient. People don't have to go very far to find what they need. They're living on top of the shop where they're buying. You know, it's all big goulash, <laughs> big mess here. But it's efficient, it works, it's dense. This is space-time adapting to functionality densely. So we really need to understand the difference uh, between these two things. <clears throat> so what it really all boils down to is we can abstract the whole thing in a, in a mathematical way in terms of agents, locations, their interactions, and the scales at which that happens. And what it's really about is keeping reasoning under control, not creating these huge feedback loops when we don't need them. Feedback loops that will slow down a system, cause congestion, cause information to travel to places it doesn't really need to go, but rather separate concerns uh, by localizing information as much as possible and just collecting <coughs> I mean, just collecting data for those processes we think where there is still innovation to be, to be made. And to do that, we may have to just uh, rethink the way that we scale systems and the kinds of tools that we're building to do so today. So, thank you.